super stuff so thanks very much to everyone for joining today's webinar um so we're going to be looking at the masters of science in sports performance practice so we're looking enough to have some guest speakers with us today with sean taylor um paul fisher um and ken van samarum from atu here in letter kenny so Ken, um, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, we'll get a quick overview on the course and look, we'll be getting a bit more detail on our guest speakers as we go through. So I'll let them introduce themselves and, and go through their own story, if that's OK. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Keith. And uh, hi, everyone. Th thanks for joining us here. So I, I'm Ken. I'm a lecturer in sport performance and innovation here at ACU Donegal. Um, help deliver a number of the modules and supervise the research projects with, with, within this program. And what we want to focus on here is just giving you what I'm going to do in the first part is just provide an overview of the program, how it might suit you. Um, but then really importantly, the second part is going to be a panel discussion where you can hear from a mix of people, um, all professionals in their field, and I'll give a very brief introduction to them later, then obviously let them tell you a bit about themselves, what they're doing now, how they got there, and so perhaps some top tips for professional development in strength and conditioning. So I suspect you've all had a look online and seen at least something about the programme, or possibly heard from friends and people you know. But just to give you a flavour of what we do in our approach, really our focus is first and foremost about the application of science to practice. So of course we dig into the theory, of course we dig into the science uh, underpinning the physiology, the nutrition, the performance analysis and the strength and conditioning and so on. But really importantly in this programme, what we're focusing on is how can we translate the theory and the research and the science into practice for ourselves as practitioners, for fellow practitioners, for athletes, players and sports coaches. And so because of that, the importance of that approach, we're very much about blending the science and the art of performance. So, yes, it's about technical knowledge, but it's also about the professional skills that underpin that as well. And for those of you already practicing as strength and conditioning coaches, you know very well that there's a demand on your technical expertise, but also on some of these soft skills. So how we actually communicate, how we build relationships, how we work in teams and so on. And so this is fundamental to the program as well. And if I was to distill the program down into the sort of three key themes that run through everything we do, firstly, it's taking an approach of understanding what it takes to win in sport. Now, this could be at the highest of levels. So it could be um, All-Ireland, it could be World Championship, World Cup, Olympic Games, Paralympic Games and so on. It could be county level, it could be club level. It doesn't matter. We look at all of these. But it's all about breaking down performance to understand, OK, what does it take from an athlete or player perspective and a practitioner perspective to help achieve that. Secondly, we take a multidisciplinary approach throughout. So yes, we do have modules in strength and conditioning and physiology and nutrition and so on. But even throughout those modules, we're very much linking between the two and encouraging learners to look broadly because no performance problem or performance challenge sits within any one discipline. And indeed, the best solutions never sit within one discipline either. And really importantly, from a professional perspective, a focus on impact. What is going to make a difference? Because as sports performance professionals, we are here to support the health, the well-being and the performance of players and athletes. Support sports coaches achieve what they need to achieve in terms of results. And if we can't do that, then we're not adding value and we probably won't be in that position for too much longer. So the programme is all about a focus on this and equipping learners with the ability to do that. So just by way of an overview, and this I know was in the communication that went out, it's intentionally designed to give a broad knowledge 
but for science of sports performance. And this is why we don't just focus on strength and conditioning. Similarly, we don't just focus on nutrition as some other master's programs do. But we do allow lots and lots of opportunity for learners to really drill down and specialize in different areas, both within the coursework, within their modules, but also within the research project that comes at the end. And again, I'll speak a little bit more about that in just a moment. The delivery schedule is very much designed for professional learners, which means it's highly flexible. The broad structure is two semesters. So we have the winter and the Easter semesters and a research project, which can be done at any time. Most weeks we have online classes, which are recorded. They take place on a Thursday and Friday morning. We record them, we make them available on the internal learning management system, which means you can go back and view them at any time. So if you're working or you can't make that timetable slot, you can still see the session. You still benefit from the content, the directed study and everything else that goes with it. And then twice in each semester, we run a two day practical block on campus up here in Letterkenny. So Thursday and Friday, and what we focus on there is the things that we can't do online. So it's practical skills in the high performance strength and conditioning suite or in the high performance laboratory or some of the other facilities. It will also be some teamwork as well so, and development of soft skills and evaluation of some of these soft skills. So very much blending again the theory with the practice between the online delivery and those on-campus blocks. What most people are keen to hear is that there's no exams. Um, the whole programme is assessed through coursework, or so what we call continuous assessment. And I've mentioned this already, but take the physiology module, for example, which is one of the ones I deliver. There's a choice of which sport or which event or which population you go and study the physiological demands or put together a training program in. So again, this is one of the examples of where you can really specialise and develop that deep understanding in topics of your choice. And again, if you've seen online, you'll know what the modules are. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm not going to go through these one by one, but we do have some discipline specific modules again with this multi-interdisciplinary approach running through them. But a couple of things to pull out here. Firstly would be the professional practice module, which happens in the second semester. And this is all about what do you need to be working on in your professional development to be successful and to become accredited and qualified in the career of your choice. So if it's strength and conditioning, for example, we work with you to identify the relevant qualifications, accreditation pathways, what you can be do doing during this programme and beyond to qualify and progress your career. So that's all about you. And again, it's the craft, if you like, or the art is both the technical and it's the soft skills. The second thing is the research project which you can see bottom and just below halfway down these two electives. So outside of the two semesters, you choose either a dissertation, a classic research project, or a work-based learning research project. And again, this is designed with professional learners in mind. So this allows you to do, to critically review a problem, put together a smaller portfolio of research, and then do your own critical reflection of your time in the workplace. So very much about experiential learning and maximizing the development opportunities you get from that. And again, the topic you choose for either of these is entirely down to you. So huge choice again. And maybe when we throw this open to our panel discussion, we'll, we'll just explore a little bit more around accreditation pathways and development opportunities and so on. Very briefly, the course team. Um, I won't go through each of us, but just to let you know, between us, we've got 
long, extensive, both applied and research experience. So everyone here has worked with sports teams at the very highest level, um, also actively engaged in research as well. So what we're always trying to do is research some of these real world sports performance challenges or performance questions, conduct the high quality research, and then really make sure we're disseminating, communicating, partnering with sports organizations to inform practice and get the knowledge out there. We're also very fortunate between us all to have a brilliant set of professional networks and we pull people in from there to give guest lectures. Anyone from um, early career professionals who might be a little bit closer to people in, in the MSC through to some of the absolute world leaders in their field. So you get a real mix again of technical content and expertise with the opportunity to hear from people who, who've been there and done it or in the process of doing it and developing their own careers. So again, a very rich learning opportunity from that. Last thing from me before we open up, and Nicola may well want to come in a little bit on this as well, but just to let, let you know briefly around access and, and application. We typically um, look for candidates or applicants with a level eight, so an undergraduate degree in a sport related subject. However, we also have a route for those without a level eight in sport or without a level eight who can demonstrate through their own professional experience that they have attained a similar standard. And we really encourage applications from people in this position because people that fit this route very often have a huge amount of professional experience and real world insights. And that contributes an awful lot to the course and the, the cohort of students as well. So if you're here or if you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, you know, my undergraduate degree was in something else or I don't have an undergraduate degree, please do not let that put you off. Consider this route. On the final slide, you'll see my email address. Um, Keith will put his or my email address in the chat here now as well, just so you've got that. And please drop us a line at any time. OK, any queries about that route or indeed the programme as a whole, just ask. Application is via the application form, which is available on the website course page. So just Google ATU Sport Performance, MSC or any of those words, you'll find us. Um, the closing date is very, very close. So we would urge you to do this as quickly as possible if interested. Now, we do have a series of scholarships. Um, we have GPA, so Gaelic Player Association scholarships uh, that the university has, and they're awarded across all postgraduate courses. But perhaps not surprisingly, an MSc in sport tends to attract more of the relevant candidates for this. So again, if you think, if you'd like to know more about that, or you think you might fit the bill as a Gaelic sports player, drop us a line. And then there's ATU scholarships as well, particularly something called the Pushing Boundaries Scheme, which you may well be eligible for. So any questions and you can't find it online, drop any of us an email. Nicola, anything I've missed there that you'd like to add? I don't think so. Um, Ken, you've mentioned the pushing boundaries also, which is good. So I suppose that's for anybody that doesn't fit the bill around the GPA um, and are not receiving a scholarship elsewhere, they most likely will be eligible for that particular scholarship within ATU, but you won't know that until you're on the programme. Um, but we've had a very successful strike rate with that, with participants that have completed the programme in the past. Perfect. Thank you. And maybe the only other thing to say is we, we have had quite a few learners in the past who have had their fees, if not fully, certainly in part supported by their employer. So some of you might be self-employed, which is a different situation. But if you are employed, then it's always, of course, you should be having a conversation with your employer around your own career aspirations, your professional development and the sort of opportunities that might contribute to that. 
Great. OK, so if anyone does have any questions there about the programme as well, please feel free to put them in the chat and hopefully we'll have a bit of time at the end that we can touch on those. But what I'm going to do now is just introduce our panel members. Keith, keep an eye because I've just had a message from Sean saying he is just about to join us, so hopefully he'll be appearing very soon. Um, but we've got three fantastic guests here, so all strength and conditioning professionals. By way of very brief introduction, and I'm going to hand over to them, we've got Sean Taylor, so professional S&C coach doing lots of things, as you'll hear about in a moment and was actually one of our students on the first cohort running through this program a couple of years ago. Sean Flannery, who is on his way in, um, is head of strength and conditioning for Sligo Rovers and runs his own um, strength and conditioning fitness center SFX in Sligo. And Paul Fisher, who is both a strength and conditional strength and conditioning professional with huge amounts of experience and also a lecturer on this master's program at ATU. So gents, and unfortunately it is three gents we've got, we don't have any female representatives in this, which is a shame, but Sean, maybe you can just kick us off, Sean Taylor, and just maybe just tell us very briefly what your role or roles are now, and maybe just a little bit about the journey you've taken to get there. Yeah, perfect, Ken will do. Um, first of all, thanks a million for having me on. It's nice to come back from a course I'd done a couple of years ago and explain to people kind of what I've done with the course myself in terms of my own development. So um, over the last couple of years, I have based myself in the northwest of Ireland. So currently working out of County Sligo. Over the last three years, I've developed and honed my skills from the course um, as an S&C coach uh, in particular. Uh, I'm working within the Sligo Grammar School now um, with their rugby team mainly as head of performance. So looking at all the age groups from 14s the whole way to 18 and a half. That's both now male and female since last year. So doing a lot of good work with them. Um, and then currently alongside with that, I've been involved with uh, team sports like Psycho GEA. So I've been involved with their minor to senior setup for the last two years also. I was a part of the under 20 backroom team that won Connacht back to back over the last two years and we got to an All-Ireland final this year as well. So kind of shows that we're putting a lot of good work into our underage setup with coaches and support staff. And it's good to see we're, we're reaping the rewards of that. And then also seasonally then, I'm working with basketball in Basketball Ireland. So I'm working with their female academies and making sure they're all staying on top of their athletic development throughout the um, international season, but also through their club season as well. While they're not in our hands, we still got to make sure we have good structures in place where they're getting looked after and supported throughout the whole calendar year. From the course itself, um, as Ken has mentioned to you all, it is multifaceted in terms of what we're covering. So we have those nutritionists, performance analysis, S&C, then your own professional development. I think having that broad range gives us a good idea as to what other disciplines need to know. And then we can draw insights from that if you're an S&C professional or the opposite way around, if you're mainly a nutritionist, you've got to be able to understand what the S&C guys are talking about and what they need to correlate with mm. to terms of what good performance is. And then we can tackle well, that. Sean, sorry. Let, I'm going to ask you to hold that thought because I, I'm, I'll, I'll sure. bring everyone in and we'll, we'll have a bit of discussion around that in a yeah, while as right. well. Um, but I think another thing we'll pick up and is, you know, you've you've come out of the Masters and obviously you were working during the Masters and before as well. But, you know, you've come out just two years ago and now doing an incredible amount at county and national level. So it'll be interesting in a moment to get your your thoughts and insights on, you know, what it takes to you to advance your career and the sort of things that our um, audience might be able to learn from that. So we'll come back to that. But thanks. Yeah, of course. Um, Paul, perhaps you can give us a quick intro of where you are now and how you've got there. Yeah, no problem. Again, thanks for having me on the, the talk. Um, so as a sports science undergraduate, I suppose I had a bit of an interest in strength and conditioning and I've been in this industry now since 2010, since graduating. Um, my main background would have been in GA initially, so I would have worked with Donegal GA right through, the, I suppose, the, the good times. 
um, from 2010 right through to 2020. Um, thereafter, I would have worked with Donegal Ladies. I would have worked in pro soccer in the Northwest as well with Derry City FC. Um, and a lot of club teams, I suppose, in GA and soccer around here in the region as well. Um, a couple of my more main roles now, I, I do have a gym, so I am operating as a day-to-day SNC coach with, I suppose, the public rather than just elite athletes as well. So it's something we can touch on. Um, you know, as a lot of our practices can be brought back to the non-elite environment as well. Um, and a couple of exciting roles, I suppose, I'm working with um, ATU closely now as well with their scholarship-based athletes as well. So that's something we're trying to to tie together from a research perspective and the practical side as well, where we're uh, providing strength conditioning services and supports to our high performing athletes that avail of ATU scholarships. Um, so that's something as well that, um, you know, if you come on board as a master's student or if you want to get involved, that you'll be very hands on helping with us, you know, linking those relationships between I suppose, the classroom and the gym or the field. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much where yeah. I'm at in a nutshell. Perfect. Thank you, Paul. Now, I can see a hand up from a meeting guest. That may well be Sean, is it? Are you with us, Sean? No, if not... Just bear with me a second, Ken. You see um, attendees can't access their microphone, so I'm just going to change that. OK. Can you hear me, guys? We can. Is that Sean? Happy days. I've been str- I'm, I'm struggling here. I'm looking at you, but I can't. I can't. Uh, I can't make sure that you can see me at all. But anyway, I'm here. We can't see there you. Are. You should have, have seen a nice picture now, of you. So, um, oh, how are you doing? Yeah, very good, Sean. Thanks for joining us. Look, I've just given a, a quick overview of the program, and we're just just sort of starting the panel discussion, but. The other uh, guys have just kicked off by giving a very quick intro in terms of what they're doing now and their sort of career journey to date. So do you just want to give us a quick summary of that for you, please? I can indeed, yeah. I have been looking, I have been listening to, to the guys there. Um, my my uh, pathway probably has not been as conventional as as you would normally expect um, from, from playing... Um, Elite sports, if you want to call them that, in in, in the League of Ireland or or inter county Gaelic, in the in the Naughties, uh, working in a family business in the Naughties. Um, towards the end of the Naughties, my uh, my playing days came to an end due to injury. Uh, the recession hit, so the family business uh, went um, finished up. So in my early thirties, I was left um, with no qualifications or. <clears throat> Sporting career finished, so at that point I I, I started a journey of, of part time studies, um alongside setting up my own boot you know boot camp circuit training sort of uh, classes, um I went I went through the LA, I went through UL really, um the National Council Council for Exercise and, and Fitness, so that that journey started, uh, and I continued certificates and diplomas and degrees and. Uh, Got, got to that point and, and eventually went down to the LIT Thurlis for the for the, the masters in in sports strength and conditioning, which has taken me up to, to this point now. Uh, setting up my own gym in 2018, which was probably a lifelong sort of ambition and uh, things are going good. Uh, strength and conditioning coach now with, with Sligo Rovers and uh, a number of individual athletes over over the years, probably the most most um, most notably one with Shari probably is the most prominent I would have worked with, and probably ever will work with. Um, and then on top of that, then is the the general public that's that uh, are the bread and butter of of yeah. weekly or daily life. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Sean. Really interesting. Um, yeah, and, and as you say, some of that perhaps not by design, but uh, by circumstance. But but here you are now making a great success of it. So maybe we can sort of move to, you know, looking back from where, where you all are, it, not even looking back, you know, looking forward as well, but, you know, seeing what you experience on a day-to-day basis. What do you think some of the 
some of the challenges are for qualified and practicing SNC coaches in terms of advancing their careers? And maybe Paul, you can kick us off on that one. Yeah, well, I think um, one of the things I would have seen in, in recent times is people would go and get um, a qualification um, that's very specific or very niche to a, a certain skill set. Um, the real world, when you go out into it, then it's probably not enough um, to maybe get involved with the likes of your high performing teams that we all want to be involved with. Or, um, so I think like having that broad scope that we talked about, you know, within our course is very good. You have to be able to sit down and have conversations with chartered physiotherapy, with your nutritionist, with, you know, your athletic therapist. So you have to be able, whereas if you go down maybe the more conventional routes of just one topic, or one subject, you maybe you don't pick up enough around that. Um, so I think that's one of the challenges where we have loads, you know, we have a saturated industry with people with qualifications, but when it comes down to the actual applications of jobs and so on, that they go after the people that maybe have a, a broader scope on the, the whole field and can add value across the board. Ask Sean Taylor when he goes with Irish basketball, I'm sure he's doing more than a lot. He's doing a lot more roles than just being an SNC coach. You know, he's falling water bottles, he's doing, you know, the basics, yeah. but they have they're very comfortable in the knowledge that they have someone that can do it all uh, in that sense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks, Paul. Well, maybe Sean will bring you back in on that because I, I cut you off there when you were, Sean Taylor, when I cut you off when you were starting to talk elements off that. But may, maybe you could link, you know, if you see the same challenge that Paul's articulated there, perhaps talk about that, but also to what extent do you feel the, the programme at ATU helps get you to that point i think the big word is kind of multifaceted like when we go into certain teams and whilst paul said we all want to be at the high performance level at that level they have the budget to have people who are specifically in their own roles but as you go maybe from that grassroots to podium stage you got to be able to have that overall knowledge of different aspects of sports performance so when you do do go into those certain jobs that you're not the jack of all trades, but you do know enough that can get you by. And then you can have that, you can draw insights from different areas of that multidisciplinary aspect that you can go into a team and go, look, I can actually do this. I can do that. I can give you a hand. Then it just helps you with your overall job then of being an FCC coach. Um, I kind of found that from the course that while I thought I knew a small bit about performance analysis by doing it as a player and then do nutrition as a player myself that getting that expanded knowledge through a master's degree like this uh, it definitely did help me when I went for bigger jobs because I was able to expand my knowledge to the group that I'm working with and um, so it wasn't just kind of pinned in and go well he's only he can only do this he can only do that it's yes I can definitely do a lot more than what I'm done on paper as hopefully that makes yeah. sense it should be able to then you can communicate with other coaches as well you can network a little bit better because you have that bro broader scope that you can communicate better with people. Yeah, thank you, Sean. And maybe I'll sort of throw my own perspective in here. So I'm I'm a physiologist by training. I'm a lot older than uh, <laughs> our guests on this panel here. And so I guess my career took me through uh, being very much a specialist in physiology, uh, working with the Institute of Sports in the UK with all the Olympic and Paralympic teams, then heading up the physiology team nationally to then actually in the lead up to London 2012, heading up all the sports sciences, so sort of nine disciplines, including physiology, nutrition, psychology, strength and conditioning, and so on. And as you move into these sort of more management and leadership type roles, then not only does the importance of the soft skills uh, increase, but also there has to be an appreciation. OK, not expertise but an appreciation of all these other disciplines and really importantly, where they overlap, where they fit together. And as I spoke about at the beginning, where we can find solutions to performance problems rather than the nutritionists opening their nutrition toolbox, the SNC coaches opening their nutrition toolbox and trying to find the right tool in there. The tools aren't in there. The tools are within your skills. And it's a case of how we put those together. Um, but Sean Flannery, we, we can see you now. Thanks. Um, but maybe you'd just like to comment on that as well, just just in terms of, you know, s some of the challenges you see for 
up and coming and developing strength and conditioning coaches? Yeah, um, I, I do feel that, uh, you know, and, and to really focus on, on, on stuff that you're good at, I think it, it's, it's, it's important to, to find your, from, from my own perspective, it's, it's figure out what, what, what you are really good at and, and hone in on that and instead of trying to be, uh, you know, a jack of all trades, as was mentioned, but, you know, um, I, I have no problem. I have no problem outsourcing testing or nutrition or uh, any, any, any aspect uh, from, from, my, from my own perspective. You know, I, I know what I'm good at and I know areas that I'm, I'm weak at. So I really focus on what I'm good at. And I think that that's probably, that's probably the most important thing I could advise anybody Instead of trying to be a nutritionist and trying to be a sports psychologist, and, you know, little bits and pieces here and there, just figure out what, what, your, what your niche is and, and really get good at it and, and be, be, the, be the best um, at, at that. That's probably what, what I would have gone for. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks, Sean. We often hear this expression and we use this expression of staying in our lane. Um, you know, and if you're an SNC coach, you don't pretend you're a nutritionist or try and be a nutritionist. But I think yeah. that's certainly an Elaine analogy almost encourages silos. And we look at the nutritionist on the far side of the pool, if we carry on the metaphor. Uh, but actually, what we should be doing is all getting in the same lane and working together to address these problems. Um, Paul, from your perspective, we, we've touched a little bit on the sort of technical knowledge, but also the soft skills. So, gosh, this can be anything from building empathy and rapport to communication, building trust, problem solving, innovation. Where, perhaps just share your sort of thoughts on the relative importance of these soft skills or professional skills. Yeah, well, like if you look at, it, I suppose, most people on this talk, uh, I think it is a, th a thing in the industry with the S&C industry and the kind of high performance industry. A lot of us end up in it by d default where we've had a massive interest maybe as athletes ourselves or, you know, at, maybe it's uh, coaching the sport to now wanting to know more about the sport and we delve into it. Um, so I think like you've already used the word, having empathy for athletes is a massive thing, you know, so being able to judge characters of those type of athletes, so how we coach them and how we train them and how we treat them can be very, very different across the board based on, you know, what type of person they are. And I think, you know, the more, I suppose, coaching you do, the more you learn that not everybody's the same. And like, again, we can, we can use the word empathy, but there's a different, there's an understanding of people as well within that. Um, you know, yes, it's all good and well you, that you might have a, a high performance athlete in front of you, but how you treat that person could be, you know, very much like an amateur athlete at times where you have to be, you know, you have to be on top of them all the time, where you can have a high performance athlete that, you know, you can be very confident they'll do everything asked of them and then go and do it on their own. Um, so that soft skill set of knowing people and knowing how to coach and how to train and how to I suppose teach people um mm -hmm. can be very very important and it's something I know it's something we've talked about to our cohort of students in the previous course um you know that's a big big part of having the practical coaching days where we get to see people interact so you can be really really smart in the books you can be really really smart in the presentations but when it comes to actually presenting yourself as a coach and how you interact with the athlete in front of you, the person in front of you, that's a soft skill set that's going to be very, very important. And again, that's going to be maybe the difference of getting a job and not getting a job when you sit down and have those interactions or those conversations with, I suppose, the people in power. Brilliant. Yeah, thanks, Paul. And, you know, we, as you mentioned, we, we address a lot of this in the programme. But importantly, where it's addressed is, if we look at any professional accreditation pathways, they always include both the technical and the non-technical competencies as well. So that professional practice module, all about really understanding what's needed in your own professional development to be able to get there. Um, Sean F, I, I, I'm interested in, obviously one of your key roles now with Sligo Rovers, and of course you were a player back in the day as well. So you walk into that sport, you have an understanding, you have an empathy with players and coaches. I think you walk in and there's a level of trust and respect there because you've worked it, you've been in that sport at the highest level. 
what are your reflections on moving into a completely different sport that you have never done? Um, you know, at, what are the challenges or what are the opportunities to apply your skills to make sure that you can deliver that level, same level of impact? Yeah, it's um, it definitely makes a difference when you have when you have a connection to the to the sport or the, or the club. Um, I would have done some stuff uh, in the past with Sligo Rugby Club, and I definitely found I found it challenging to to gain the respect of of the of the players, having not ever held a rugby ball in my life. Um, so in, in that regard, I don't I honestly don't think don't think it makes any difference whatsoever. You know. Um, what what sport you, what what your sporting background is, but but I think just from a level of uh, of 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 respect even for starters and an appreciation of the demands of um, of the of players in question, that that has to be a consideration. But uh, it it, it that, you know in my in my experience that would make it it makes it a positive. It's a has a positive yeah. has had a positive impact on. on my interactions. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean you're going to get people to work any harder. That's yeah. that's a that's a given. <laughs> no, very true. And, and I think about my you know my own career. God, I've worked, been fortunate to work with lots of sports, but Formula One would be a good example. You know, I've never been anywhere yeah. near a Formula One car. Um, however, the approach we take as professionals and very much what underpins this program as well. What's the method? You know, how do we go about critically analysing and understanding the demands of a sport or an event? You know, this is why I call out this theme of understanding what it takes to win. If we start there, we can then come back to first principles, draw on our technical knowledge and understanding and then help people in synchronise swimming, you know, archery, what, whatever sport it might be. But Sean, you, you know, uh, Sean T, you've, as you said in your intro, you, you know, you're working across a number of sports, but Basketball would be a good example that you started working in. Um, now, you might tell me I'm wrong. You have played a lot of basketball in your time. But as far as I'm aware, you're not a basketball player, but you've managed to walk, you know, do some very good work in that. So how's this been in your experience? Yeah, I'm blessed with hype, but not blessed with skill, Ken. So uh, <laughs> I uh, fit it in height-wise, but not skill-wise. No, uh, just kind of going back to what you're saying is that while we can keep the principles the same through competitive sports or field-based sports or court-based sports. Um, it's also the culture inside it as well. We have to understand that. And that's through our soft skills. If we have the competency to understand what the culture is currently in terms of performance within the sport we're playing at, obviously from amateur level to international level, it changes again. But um, the setup I went into for Basketball Ireland I wouldn't say there was a massive emphasis on the physical performance side of things, but definitely the skill, technical, technical side of things. So the way you have to sell it and the way you have to speak to your key stakeholders as well and tell them, look, you want your pillars of performance are your technical and your tactical, but there's also your physical and mental there as well. If we can get a good sustainable structure there within the group, it's definitely going to help you build your other pillars as well. So, um, it's yet yeah, that soft scale of being able to communicate to your stakeholders while they could be your coaches, they could be your sponsors, your main investors, but also your players as well. They're stakeholders too. If you don't get buy-in from them, you can have the best program in the world, but if you're getting very little buy-in from it or um, completion or consistency, it's uh, null and void. So having the principles of training are good, but having the understanding of what the culture is and who your stakeholders are, and how to get them to buy in was also a positive, a big thing to work on as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Sean. I mean, and there's so much valuable insights in there. I'm, a, I'm aware of time. I'm going to put one final question really briefly to the panel. Um, I'll let you think about this. Your one top tip for SNC coaches advancing their career. I think you've probably covered a lot of this already, but one brief top tip. And before I come to the panel, I'll just remind people, if there are any questions, please do type them in the chat or get in touch with us via email afterwards. You know, delighted to, you know, jump on a call with you, discuss the course, see how it fits with your own professional development at any time. 
So, um, Paul, go on, kick us off. Your top tip. Uh, I suppose know where you are um, in the sense that what almost what Sean F said, know what your skill set is, know what you're good at and know when you have to, I suppose, plug the gaps, know when you have to go and learn a bit more. Um, That's one of the things we talked about again last year with our students was, you know, address where you are now, look at where you want to be and what are you what are you missing in between to get there um, and going after those skills, you know, we one wee bit by bit will help you get there eventually. So uh, yeah, that for me, just know where you are and how you're going to get to where you want to get. Plot your roots. Brilliant. Thank you. Sh- Sean F. I would say, uh, be, be, yeah, be open to uh, to keep learning. Yeah, be open to to accept that you, you you'll never know it all, and just to keep yeah keep uh, on that on that journey of of learning. Yeah, great point. Thank you. And Sean? Well, you threw them very good answers now. It'd be hard to get <laughs> But um, definitely see your education and your development as an investment, not a cost. Um, the big thing is that there is going to be certain things that are going to be have to be paid for because we are being taught by other professionals and that's their job. Um, you know, by staying accredited in whatever field you're in, uh, investing in small little courses, picking up little bits here by there. And as Sean F said, it's like, just understand that you're not going to know everything, but try and chase that. You'll try to be the best you can. So we see it as an investment, not a cost. Great point. Great soundbite as well. I might use that in the future. Thank you, Sean. Um, guys, thanks ever so much for that. that that's been hugely valuable and really interesting. I just would, I would have loved to have more time to dig even deeper, but I really appreciate your insights. Um, so on that, I will hand back to you, Keith. Thanks very much, Ken. And yeah, listen uh, to the three guys there. Thanks very much for your time. Um, as Ken said, there are some really valuable insights, um, some great bits of information. Hopefully the people on the call today will have gotten some some useful information from that. So um, just before we finish up, Nicholas or Anthony, you want to go through? Sorry, I didn't introduce Nicola at the start. She's the head of the department here in ATU. So Nicholas, Anthony, you want to touch on there? No, it's just I suppose to reiterate everything that Ken said, the most important piece here now is this programme will run subject sufficient numbers, you know, to run the programme. Therefore, we do need a good guide on, who, you know, who wants to do the programme. Therefore, just encourage you to put your application in as soon as possible or reach out to any member of the team. Keith can both put their email addresses there in the message board. Mines is on the website. So feel free. We, I recognise some faces or some names that are on the call here that we're already in conversation with. But please do reach out. Um, like This programme might not be for everyone, but Ken has very eloquently explained who it might be for, as did the as did the speakers. So just reach out to us, folks. That's probably the big thing we'd say. Our USP, like Ken outlined, is definitely the delivery schedule, balancing it with work, life and study. And um, so we're happy to chat through that in more detail if you so wish. So just I suppose I'm just encouraging you to get in touch. Super, Nicola. Thanks. Yeah. So I just popped Nicola's email there in the chat box. So if people want to take note of it, like I said, any questions that you have over the next couple of days, feel free to get into contact with us. So look, conscious of time there, guys, just gone two o'clock. So again, thanks everyone for taking the time to join the call. Thanks to Ken for, for moderating it and for the three guys for your time and information. Um, We'll chat to you again soon. So thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye, thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank okay, you. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.